right, we're going to keep going on population, and this time we're considering population composition, what it is and how it's represented in population pyramids. And I gotta be honest, this is the stuff that geographers' dreams are made of. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well, let's get to it. Now, if you've been with me these last couple of videos, we've talked about population distribution, which describes the spatial organization of people across the world. And we've talked about population density, which tells us how many people live in those various places. But now we need to go one click deeper and figure out population composition, which describes the demographic makeup of various populations. But hold on, I just said demographic, and I probably needed to find that too. Basically, a population's demographics refers to distinct and individual traits among those people, things like ethnicity and level of education and income, etc. But for population composition, there are only two demographic traits we're going to look at, namely age and sex. So the age structure of a population refers to, not surprisingly, its organization based on age groups, and we refer to these groups as cohorts. And this is important because knowing how many people fit into different age cohorts enables geographers to draw conclusions about whether a population is growing or stable or declining. Put that in your pocket because we're going to come back to it in a minute. Now, related to a population's age structure is their dependency ratio, which is the number of people in the dependent age groups divided by the number of people in the working age groups multiplied by 100. So dependents are those people who are, you know, dependent on other people to survive. And here it means that they're either too young or too old to work. And in general, that means people younger than 15 and older than 65. So suppose this country right here has a population of 60 million and 15 million of them are younger than 15, while 5 million of them are older than 65. And that would leave 40 million in the working age cohort. So we do some fancy mathy mathy stuff and find that the dependency ratio in this country is 50%. And look, I know that's pretty basic math, but I'm a humanities teacher and that feels like a pretty big accomplishment. So, you know, don't take this away from me. Anyway, knowing the dependency ratio is important because it determines the pressure carried by the working population to support the other groups. And the higher that number, the heavier the burden on working age people to support their dependents. And then the lower the number, the less pressure is put on working age people to support their dependents. Okay, so age structure is one ingredient in the population composition stew. And now let's consider the second ingredient, namely sex ratio, which represents the comparison of males to females in a population. And this is an important measure because it can tell geographers a lot about a population, like gender equality or the birth rate of a population. And as you've probably come to expect by now, sex ratios vary depending on the scale of analysis. For example, globally, the sex ratio is about 101 men to 100 women. But then regionally in Europe, for example, it's 95 men to 100 women. Or nationally over in China, it's about 105 five men to 100 women. And you should be like, wait, what's, what's going on over in China? Because the dudes are crushing it. Well, there's a lot of reasons for the male skewing of China's population, including a general preference for male children. But the most significant factor is historical. And here's where I introduce you to China's one-child policy. So starting in the 1970s, China's population was exploding faster than a sneeze through a screen door. And more babies means more mouths to feed. And that got the Chinese officials a little twitchy about whether they would have the resources to keep all those people alive. So they went ahead and introduced the one-child policy, which is exactly exactly what it sounds like. However, since they had a cultural preference for male children, many female children were either aborted or abandoned, and that's how you get a severely unbalanced sex ratio in China. Now, to be fair, they have rolled that back some in the last few years, but it's going to take a long time to balance that ratio out. Okay, now that we've got both ingredients in our population composition stew, age structure, and sex ratio, now we can look at one of the key tools geographers use to analyze population composition, namely population pyramids. And you're going to need to get real cozy with this concept because it's for sure going to show up on your exam. So here's how it works. On the y-axis, we plot five-year age cohorts, and then on the x-axis, that represents the sex ratio. And there are four typical shapes that you got to know. First is the rapid growth population, which looks like this. This pyramid is always going to be wide at the bottom and narrow at the top. Down here, we see that there are metric buttloads of young people, but up here, there are relatively few older people. So what does that tell us? Well, this shape is often associated with developing countries where the birth rate is high and lifespan is shorter. And a good example of this in real life is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And what this kind of pyramid means for them is that they'll face challenges like providing for the needs of all these children, like, you know, food and education. But then there's the slow growth population, which looks like this. Here, the birth rate is slightly higher than the death rate, and so the population is still growing, just not as rapidly. And a good real-life example here is China, and that narrow base can be linked, at least in part, to the one-child policy I mentioned earlier. And here, as the population ages, countries like this are going to face challenges of providing health care for the elderly. And then this shape represents stable growth population. And here, the birth and death rates are similar, and you can see that there is roughly an even distribution throughout the different age ranges. And that means the growth rate of the population is zero or, you know, close to zero. And a good example here is the United States. The population is growing, but 
but barely. And finally, you've got this shape, which is the ultimate bummer we call a declining population. Here, the base is narrower than the top, and that means that the birth rate is declining while people are living longer. A good example here is Germany, and countries like this are going to face challenges like labor shortages because not as many people are working as there are retiring. Well, all right, click here to keep reviewing my other Unit 2 videos, and if you just don't like reading your textbook but you still want to get an A in your class, then click here to grab my video note guides for this video and all my videos. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.